Welcome to the review of Master of the Night, written by Alexander Kantorovich, the third and final book in the Escape from Tarkov novelized trilogy. If you haven't watched my previous book reviews, please go watch them now. This review and summary will be split into two parts. Please enjoy. The book starts off with The Boar, a major gang leader in Tarkov being asked to meet at a now defunct mall for a meeting with a mysterious entity. It appears that this is not the Ultra Shopping Mall, at least for now. It mentions that it contains a large theater and casino, but either way, it's a very large and ultra modern shopping mall. It's possible that this could be the Ultra Mall and that the details are different because the design of the mall was not finalized when the book was written. When the boar arrives, a lone figure in a hood is sitting on top of a table in the middle of the casino and refuses to talk to the boar's sentries. He requests the boar to come inside. The boar does so and begins speaking with the cultist inside. At first, the boar becomes bored of the enigmatic talk of the cultist and threatens to leave when the cultist starts talking about being a witness to the arrival. But when the boar is about to leave, uninterested in further religious ramblings, the cultist stops himself then finally reveals that his name is Peter and that he is a priest. He says that all cultists are equal and that they have no bosses or hierarchy, with one exception, the true rulers of the world. When the boar urges Peter to cut to the chase, Peter tells him that they want the predator, who we know as Dennis. It also becomes apparent that the cult still doesn't know that the Predator and Dennis are the same man, but they do know that they are somehow related and that they want both of them. The Boar immediately cites several events over the course of the last two books as reasons why one should not go hunting down the Predator to the cultists. Makar, the Foma gang, and even the first priest that Dennis killed that knew Misha. The cultists visibly cringed at the mention of the death of one of their priests and kept pressing the Boar to help, but he refused. Eventually, the boar suggested that the cultists go to Yusek for help, but that's as much help as he's willing to offer, and he's perfectly happy to not be in the predator's crosshairs. The priest finally relents and draws a cross on the playing card table he was sitting on, and tells the boar that if he ever wants to meet again, that he should return and draw a cross on the table, and they will arrange another meeting. After leaving, the boar's men never observed anyone leave the building, but after returning, they found that the cultists are using underground tunnels to travel all over Tarkov, and that's how they gained access to the building in the first place. The book then cuts to Dennis, who's back at his terror group bunker with Oleg. They are both trying to decipher all kinds of random technology they found in the shipping containers from the previous book, and making good progress. During this process, they also found that their bunker was hooked up into a network of some kind, and that life support system information was constantly being sent through that network to an unknown server or person. Dennis muses that he wants to get to the bottom of why this all exists, but until then, he feels secure in the bunker. Then, the book switches to a small USEC squad that is set up in a building observing a street within Tarkov City. A squad of USEC is approaching from down the street, apparently moving slowly because they have quite a lot of loot, although what kind of loot isn't mentioned. The squad in the building is supposed to cover their advance through the area so that their friends can make it back to base safely. All is going well until one USEC with a scoped rifle feels a presence behind him and turns around to find not one, but three hooded cultists standing behind him, with shotguns leveled at his face. He glances around, and notices that the cultists are moving completely silently through the building, and standing right outside of the various rooms and hallways that all of his comrades are in. Basically, they are completely screwed if they try to make a move. Without saying anything, the Yusek slowly places his rifle on the ground, and one of the cultists removes his hood and explains that they mean no harm and that in three days' time, they wish to meet with any Yusek that has spoken with Dennis. The captured Yusek simply nods in the affirmative, too scared to speak, and the cultist tells him that all of their weapons will be stacked up behind the door of the entrance, as they have no need for them, and that one Yusek standing watch had to be stunned in order to prevent him from shooting, but he'll recover. Then, the cultists all silently leave, but slam the door on their way out. Mark Forbit, the Yusek counterintelligence officer from the previous book, heads back to the same location with a significant entourage of guards for the meeting. After scanning the building with thermal imaging, they do see that at least one person is occupying the building, although Mark suspects that there may be more. Mr. Forbit then leaves all of the USEC guards outside and heads inside to find Peter the cultist priest sitting in a chair by a window. Peter requests that USEC deliver the predator, Dennis, or both to them, to which Mark scoffs at this idea and that it's not so easy to do that. But just as the conversation is about to reach a dead end, 
Mark decides to help out, as he wants to know more about the cult's operations, so he suggests that he will try to draw out Dennis. But in return, he wants some kind of insight into the cult, as they don't clash with Yusek often, but there have been some problems in the past. Peter replies that this is because Yusek go places within Tarkov where they do not belong, and that these are places of power. Confused, Mark asks what places are these supposed places of power, and to provide Mark with a list so that Yusek can avoid these places. Peter agrees, and will supply Mark with a list of these places upon their next meeting. Again, Peter instructs Mark to leave a line marked on the wall of the entryway if he wishes to meet. If the line is crossed, the meeting is confirmed. Before leaving, Peter asks Mark several times what kind of man Dennis is. Not knowing how to respond, Mark says that he doesn't know. Then even suggests that the predator might not even be a man. Peter seems intrigued by this, and then the conversation ends. The book cuts back to Dennis, who is now showing concerns for a local scav group that has taken up residence in a large building near his bunker. If these scavs were to come poking around his bunker and discover just how fortified it is, now that Dennis has three working auto turrets to defend the place, they may decide to sell or trade this information to powerful parties that may try to defeat his defenses, as a place that is so well guarded must obviously contain something very valuable. One distinction I'd like to make here is that the book makes it very apparent that scavs are a minority group within Tarkov, and that they are much less commonly found than the big bandit gangs. They operate in very small groups, and are kind of like bumbling idiots with terrible weapons and gear that prey just about on anyone they come across. But the big gangs are the one that really run the streets of Tarkov, so maybe we'll see these gangs in the game in the future. Anyways, he infiltrates the Scav stronghold fairly easily, and learns that there's a well under the building that the Scavs are sourcing clean water from, and a warehouse nearby that had an immense supply of sugar. So naturally, the Scavs began to produce moonshine, and sell it to traders in the area, as well as their clean water. Dennis knew that he had to get rid of this group of scavs, so while infiltrating their hideout at night, he repeated one of the tricks he played on Makar's gang previously, and spiked several dozen bottles of their moonshine with a powerful laxative. The following day, about a half dozen of these scavs returned to their base after making a trip to a local trader with bloody noses, and all of their weapons confiscated. When asked why by their leader, the shamed scavs told the bewildering tale of how when the moonshine they brought to sell was sampled, that everyone at the trader outpost began to violently shit themselves, and then another group of local scavs were hired to rough them up and take away all their guns. Also, the trader would no longer do business with the scav group. A few nights later, Dennis makes his move by taking out a sentry of the scav group. When a group of them goes to investigate, several more scavs are taken out with terrifying speed and accuracy which strikes fear into the entire group. Dennis can see at night with the aid of night vision, while the rest of the scavs have no idea where the suppressed shots are coming from. After several have been taken out, they finally retreat to a nearby warehouse and stay there until morning, no one daring to come outside. When morning dawns, they find one of their own who is still alive, injured in the leg, but now bandaged up and actually in quite good condition. The scav tells the rest that the predator wounded him in the leg, then approached him and disarmed him telling him that he meant no harm. After injecting him with something, the scav told his buddies that he began to feel better almost immediately, and then the predator gave him a medical kit and some kind of radio, with instructions that their leader contact the predator with this radio. At some point, Dennis must have made the decision that wiping out the scav group might not be in his best interest, and that after striking fear into them, he could gain their respect. He made an offer to their leader, that he drop off a specified amount of water and moonshine to a specific address, and in return, they would receive gifts. Any remainder of what they produce can be sold to traders, as they have done in the past. Not wanting to fall victim to continued nighttime assaults, they agreed. And upon receiving their first gift from the Predator, they found that working with the Predator was very much in their best interest. The first gift package contained AKS-74Us, ammunition, military ration kits, and high-quality medical supplies. Happy that not only were they not the target of the Predator, but now his ally, and now in possession of what passed as luxury items within Tarkov, they partied well into the night and enjoyed unrestricted rations of meat and moonshine. Dennis takes some time to check in with his various allies in the area, or at least those who won't shoot him on sight. His first stop is to some traders, then to Gavrish's gang, who gives Dennis warm welcomes. Gavrish informs Dennis that Yusek and Bear have been fiercely fighting in the area and then an armored truck carrying a very large safe was recovered from one of their battles. 
This seems to be a very special kind of safe that requires two different forms of keys to open, and if not opened correctly, it can self-destruct. Dennis thinks to himself that this is something worth his attention, but at a later time. Then Dennis visits with the Boar's gang, and the Boar finally informs Dennis that the cult is on his trail and that he is a hunted man. Dennis remarks that this is not a surprise, considering the past altercations he's had with the cult, and he heads off to an abandoned apartment to rest for a while. While he was making his rounds to these various gangs and traders, hidden cultists have been watching his movements and relaying them back to their base. The building Dennis chose was a decoy hideout, a place he can retreat to if he feels he's being followed. Dennis has rigged a room on the fourth floor with explosives, and has fashioned the room to appear that has been recently occupied, with a bed, food, and other provisions. Hiding in a completely different room, Dennis attaches a thermal optic to his Zig submachine gun. By the way, the 9mm Zig that the book mentions is probably actually a Sig, or a Sig Sauer submachine gun. And the book has mentioned previously that it's a western gun, so it's most likely an MPX. He spots a figure in a nearby apartment window and takes him out quietly, since his gun is equipped with a suppressor. He notices a few figures now heading into his building. When he hears them on the fourth floor, he triggers his explosives. Looking out the windows, he confirms that there was in fact actually a very large group of cultists ready to assault the building. But after the detonations, they collect the weapons and the bodies of their dead and cease their assault. Dennis thinks to himself that he could have very easily been overwhelmed by the cultists and that he shouldn't underestimate them in the future. Back at his bunker, Dennis and Oleg resume sifting through the various terror group networks and their collection of hard drives and flash drives. They've surmised that terror group has built modern infrastructure all over Tarkov including CCTV cameras that watch all kinds of locations, the sanatorium on Shoreline, the lighthouse area, and basically any and every location all over Tarkov. In some key locations, automated gun turrets were set up to defend certain terror group areas and were completely autonomous. If anything came within range, it would be automatically fired upon. Dennis remarks that this kind of thing is completely insane, especially since this was all set up during peacetime when there's no shooting or chaos in Tarkov. Oleg identifies where a main control hub may be located, and if they can get inside, they can look deeper into Terra Group's records and possibly learn more about the motivations and intentions of Terra Group and why this all started in the first place. Dennis returns to Gavrish and asks him if he and some of his men can accompany him in searching for this Terra Group command bunker. They agree and set off on what they assume will be a week-long journey to find the bunker. The only way Dennis can find this bunker is by matching up the local scenery with screenshots taken from the Terra Group CCTV database. Dennis figures out that there's a code assigned to every single zone of Tarkov that Terra Group has assigned it, so they have a very rough idea of where to start. While the book doesn't explicitly say so, it appears that Dennis's group find themselves at the Shoreline location, as Dennis mentions that the tunnel to the lighthouse is nearby, as well as there being many cottages nearby. After surveying the carnage near the tunnel, they notice that heavily armed and well put together people are patrolling near the cottages. When Dennis observes them through binoculars, he at first thinks they are bare, but then realizes they all have a standardized uniform and armor that is not familiar to him, but seems western. They seem to stick to patrolling one area, and Dennis decides to leave them alone. My best guess is that these are raiders, but I am not sure. After searching for days and not finding any sign of this bunker, Dennis starts to lose hope. But after checking a ravine, he smells a rotting corpse nearby. Locating the body, Dennis follows a blood trail to several more corpses, all unlooted scavs with some having some decent equipment, which is very suspicious to Dennis as someone would have to be insane to leave all that gear behind. Putting two and two together, he realizes they may have been targeted by an automated turret. Dennis searches the area and finally finds the location of the bunker. Scanning the area for some time, Dennis locates a terminal to shut off the automated defenses, and after also releasing the door locks, Dennis heads inside the Terra Group bunker. Inside, he notices that everything is coated in a thick layer of dust. One set of footprints on the dusty ground indicates that someone at some point had went inside the bunker and then left, but Dennis is confident that this was some time ago. Nearby is an old keypad with a display, which is unlocked using the same flash drive Dennis used to gain access to the facility. The place is dark, and on the keypad Dennis activates a line that reads, Control Room Lighting, but nothing lights up. Must be another room, he thinks. Another line says, Duty Officer Station Lighting, and he activates that, and overhead LEDs slowly begin to illuminate the area. Studying the panel, he notices that there's a room in this bunker which is an operating room. He thinks to himself that he must locate the control room, and then, of course, the chapter abruptly ends. 
The book cuts to an unknown amount of time later, and Dennis has dragged out numerous wooden weapon crates and displays them to Gavrish's gang. Inside, they find unissued and in perfect condition old weaponry, everything from SKSs to PTRS anti-tank rifles. It is a seriously massive haul of weaponry, with several dozen weapons in all. They argue about how to take it all back, but eventually agree upon slowly hauling it back, using nothing but their muscle. On their way back to safety, they were attacked by a well-organized group. It's unclear if these are scavs, cultists, raiders, or something else, but they are almost encircled by the attacking force when Dennis retreats to a pre-arranged position and fires two short bursts into the air. Immediately, the scav group that Dennis had befriended earlier that produces moonshine near Dennis's main bunker open up from concealed locations on the attackers. It seems Dennis anticipated this encounter. As soon as the attackers are all killed, all scavs leave the area and Dennis and his buddies loot the bodies, finding some very high-end body armor on the attackers. Upon returning, Gavrish's gang is overjoyed about the massive amount of loot they've just gained. But while everyone else is celebrating, Gavrish begins to wonder about Dennis. As soon as they all returned, Dennis just vanished. He didn't seem to want any of the spoils. Also, why did Dennis seemingly lead Gavrish's men into an ambush? Sure, none of Gavrish's men were killed, but it just seemed off to him. And since Dennis didn't want any of the spoils, it must mean that he gained something of very significant value during the raid. But what? Gavrish tries to make sense of it, but ultimately is unsure of what to think of it. Either way, he suspects that there is much more to Dennis than he previously thought. Dennis pays the ragtag scavs handsomely for their rescue, then returns to his bunker with Oleg to go over the terror group records he stole from the bunker Dennis visited. The bunker is old, at least 30 years old, and built during the time of the Soviet Union. But when Terror Group moved into the Tarkov region, they began to retrofit these old bunkers with new technology and use them for their own purposes. But what might that be? Dennis doesn't know yet. Also, there are tunnel networks all over Tarkov. These tunnels, built during the days of the USSR, serve some purpose. But again, that purpose isn't known yet. But Dennis is convinced that Terror Group used them for something. And it turns out that Dennis did in fact visit the operating room in the Terror Group bunker and it was completely filled with crates of weapons and ammunition. Meanwhile, Oleg is having difficulty accessing the main database of the Terror Group network. Dennis leaves it up to him to figure that out, but in the meantime, Dennis wants to explore these tunnels and see where they lead and what they're used for. Dennis, now out and exploring around Tarkov on his own, notices a sniper ambush up ahead that seems to be again near the shoreline location. Carefully avoiding the sniper by crawling through the bushes, he gets himself into a predicament where he can't really advance forward, and he can't go backwards either. Then, the sniper radios to his commander to send out a raid team to investigate the intruder. Hearing the team approach, Dennis uses a clever combination of grenade booby traps to lure the heavily geared team into a kill zone of his design. Then, he uses two Chinese M46 impact grenades to take out most of the squad. While interrogating one of the two survivors of the group, Dennis demands to know who they are and the survivor finally reveals that they are raiders. Dennis finds a way to escape, and when another raid party comes to assist the raiders, they are convinced that they were fired upon by mortars, and that they were instructed not to pursue the predator. Dennis's instructions seem to have an opposite effect, as the loss of so many men only angered the raiders. And angered the raiders, Dennis had. The raider base sent out what amounted to nearly an entire platoon of men after him. Running through the countryside, Dennis did what he can to avoid them, but eventually, they caught up to him. Dennis hid as well as he could, but was then spotted by a small squad of six raiders, but only momentarily. When they went to investigate, Dennis managed to flank around the squad and attack them from the rear, using his suppressed submachine gun. He managed to kill four and wound two, buying enough time for him to reach the terror group bunker he had visited previously with Gavrish's gang and seal the door behind him. Later on, the book switches to the leader of this raid group, nicknamed Ivan the Terrible. The wounded raiders told their boss that the slippery prey they were chasing told them that this was their final warning and to not interfere with the predator. Unimpressed with this warning, Ivan the Terrible radioed all the other raider groups in Tarkov and placed a bounty on the head of the predator, living or dead. The book then cuts to Ivan the Terrible, leader of the raiders by the coastline. One of his men informs him that a visitor intends to speak with him and that they were unarmed, with the exception of one thing, they had strange-looking knives. Ivan agrees to the summit, and hooded figures with pale skin enter his accommodations. One of the figures throws back his hood and reveals to Ivan that he is Peter, a cultist leader. 
Cultists and raiders are on somewhat neutral ground. They've had small altercations in the past, but nothing serious. Peter informs Ivan that they've been listening to their radio communiques, as they do with every group that inhabits Tarkov, and that Peter knows that the raiders have recently encountered the Predator, and they want him as well, preferably alive. After some conversation about what had happened with the raiders, Peter asks to be brought to where the battle took place. After some investigation, Peter quickly identifies the hidden entrance to the underground, and tells Ivan that the cult's primary focus right now is to fully explore the labyrinthian underground that is all over Tarkov. It's a slow and difficult process for the cult, because they can't get into these access points very easily, and the tunnels are heavily mined and booby-trapped. Some traps even seem to be manually activated by a person or a group, most likely someone from Terra Group. When Ivan asks why they want to explore these dungeons, Peter does not elaborate, and instead says that Ivan would never understand. But Peter makes Ivan a deal. The cult will provide the raiders with experienced tunnelers, and together, they can make more progress in both exploring the underground, as well as finding the Predator, than they could have separately. Ivan agrees. Back to Dennis. He's now spent three days in the tunnels under Tarkov. Already aware of booby traps from surviving in Tarkov for so long, he picks through the tunnels very slowly and carefully, and never too far from the control room next to where he entered from. A few forks in the tunnel obviously lead very deep underground, and he doesn't want to go that way. At least not yet. In one area, he found a locked steel gate, and after checking for traps and finding none, he broke the lock and found dozens and dozens of wooden weapon crates. Inside were all kinds of things from canned meat to entire crates full of SKS rifles, 7.62x39 ammunition, and in the corner of the room, even an old Maxim water-cooled machine gun. All Soviet-era supplies. Then, he gets back in contact with Oleg by interfacing with the Terra Group network that links to all other bunkers and Oleg explains that sensitive seismic sensors are picking up activity on the surface, and he urges Dennis to leave immediately. Dennis rigs up several booby traps, arms the automated defense systems, and then decides to wait and see if anything happens. The book cuts to the raiders and the cultists, with the cultists digging an area that they have identified as being an underground tunnel with the use of some kind of underground radar device that allows them to see cavities in the earth. 20 additional raiders have been sent to help Ivan, but in reality, the other raider bosses are curious as to what Ivan is up to, and why he's collaborating with the cult. Finally, the cultists breach the tunnels with explosives, and stop the raiders from jumping in the tunnels immediately, telling them that the tunnel needs time to fill with oxygen after such a blast. Then, the cultists volunteer themselves as the first to enter the tunnels. To be continued.